chapter D, section 8, Africa's Colonization and Emancipation. Introduction. In this study session, we will discuss how Africa was colonized and later decolonized. We will also examine how Mother Africa has been set in chains or imprisoned by the former colonial masters and their African prisoners, as well as the strategies for liberating Africa. Learning Outcomes When you have studied this study session, you should be able to present why and how Europeans invaded Africa, discuss the effects of colonization, explain how Africa was decolonized, outline how and why Africa is still chained, and present how Africa can be liberated. European Conquest and Colonization of Africa Colonization is the process or act of one country extending its rule over other peoples and territories with the aim of using the peoples, their land and resources for the progress of the colonial power. It involved the resettlement of some of the citizens of the colonial power in the colony to effect necessary political and socio-economic changes. Let us start by asking, why did the Europeans come to Africa? You see, this question and its correct answer are very crucial in the liberation of the minds of millions of Africans today because the combined effect of the church preaching and mission school brainwashing puts the ideas into our people's minds that the Europeans came to Africa to civilize Africans, to stop the killing of twins and the performance of human sacrifices. All these are rubbish. The Europeans also killed twins in their homes. They did human sacrifices and they burnt witches alive. You remember the British cut off the head of one of their kings for being despotic. The French also used the guillotine to execute people. Tip. Colonization is the process or act of one country extending its rule over other peoples and territories with the aim of using the peoples, their land and resources for the progress of the colonial power. It involved the resettlement of some of the citizens of the colonial power in the colony to effect necessary political and socio-economic changes. Let us start by asking, why did the Europeans come to Africa? You see, this question and its correct answer are very crucial in the liberation of the minds of millions of Africans today because the combined effect of church preaching and mission school brainwashing puts the ideas into our people's minds that the Europeans came to Africa to civilize Africans, to stop the killing of twins and the performance of human sacrifices. All these are rubbish. The Europeans also killed twins in their homes. They did human sacrifices and they burnt witches alive. You remember the British cut off the head of one of their kings for being despotic. The French also used the guillotine to execute people. Tip. Colonization is the process or act of one country extending its rule over other peoples and territories with the aim of using the peoples, their lands and resources for the progress of the colonial power. It involved the resettlement of some of the citizens of the colonial power in the colony to effect necessary political and socio-economic changes. The truth is that the white man came to Africa to get food, cheap raw materials, new lands for investing their surplus revenue, new markets for selling their excess products, and cheap labor for agricultural and industrial outputs. All these were geared towards one major thing, and that is profit maximization. 
If you doubt what we have just told you, then read these few lines of quotation written by Frederick Lugard himself in 1923. The partition of Africa was, as we all recognize, due primarily to the economic necessity of increasing the supplies of raw materials and food to meet the needs of the industrialized nations of Europe. The religion that brought the preaching of one God, brotherhood of man, equality before God, etc., and their school system that taught reading, writing, religion, and arithmetic were all part of the instruments of conquest and colonization. It was Francis Drake who said about the Ameridian that he and his co-destroyers were going to civilize. Their gain shall be knowledge of our faith, and as such riches as the Ameridian country hath. The whites colonized our consciousness through their school system, which doled out intellectual opium to our children. Hence, Hamidou Kane identified the source of infection of the black man's consciousness as a colonial school. Better than the canon, it makes conquest permanent. The canon compels the body, the school bewitches the soul. The above two quotations show the three major ways by which the Europeans took over our land, canon, religion, and school. These led to the African lamentation about Europeans in Africa that when they first came, they had the Bible, we had the land. Now, we have the Bible, they have our land. This African lamentation is believed to have originated from the East African country of Kenya. And it has a funny story to the effect that when the white men came with the Bible amidst the rich and beautiful land in Africa, he told the Africans to close their eyes so that prayer will be said. When the prayer was going on, he put the Bible in the hands of Africans and prepared documents that entitled him to the land. Now, let's look at the stages of the coming of the Europeans. First came the secret intelligence, the explorers. People like David Livingstone, Richard Burton, William Baiki, Count Brazas, Rene Kali, Mungo Park, Lander Brothers, John Clapperton, and Bartholomew Diaz. They opened up the sea routes into different parts of Africa and became heroes of Europe, not Africa. They found Africa to be rich potentially and Africans to be religious, but had no Bible and did not know about Christ. They also saw that Africans were hostile to white strangers, but very kind. Thus came the missionaries to soften the minds of Africans with sweet religious preaching about love, one God, equality of man, brotherhood of man. With the ground softened, the traders began to arrive to carry away cheap raw materials and food items. At first, the exchange took place at the coast between the whites and Africans. But later, the Onyibo wanted to make more profit at home, so had to go into the hinterland and buy things by himself by passing the middlemen. This brought trouble between the white traders and African traders and kings. Thus, the white traders went and bought armed bandits to clear the roads and inland. After the soldiers and mercenaries had finished conquering African kingdoms, chiefdoms and empires, the last group arrived, political administrators like Frederick Lugard, who became High Commissioner for Northern Nigeria in 1900. It was the political administrators that began the colonial rule over several African territories and lands. 
reflection. They found Africa to be rich potentially and Africans to be religious, but had no Bible and did not know about Christ. They also saw that Africans were hostile to white strangers, but very kind. Thus came the missionaries to soften the minds of Africans with sweet religious preaching about love, one God, equality of man, brotherhood of man. The destructions in Africa took many forms and years to accomplish. Starting with the carrying away of black people as domestic servants in Europe, along with raw materials, then slavery began about 1450 and lasted over 400 years, resulting in the dispersal of millions of Africans to over 50 countries of the world, where they live today as permanent evidence of white barbarism against Africans. Hint, military conquest backed up by national armies began officially after the Berlin Conference of 1884 to 1885. Thus, war, murder, arson, and alcohol were joined with venereal diseases to devastate Africa. Examples After King Jaja of Okobo was exiled for obstructing British trade in the Delta, then warships shelled Ebrahimi, the capital of the Nana of Wari, in 1894. It fell and Nana escaped, but later surrendered and was tried for obstructing free trade, which was in Article 1 of the Berlin Treaty of 1884 that no African leader signed. In 1897, Benin Kingdom was dismantled by British soldiers, its art treasures looted, and Oba Ovenrawen was deported to Calabar where he died. His grave was discovered in 1987. In 1901, another British column marched on Arochuku, setting the long juju of Arochuku on fire and killing its priests because the oracle was used to resist British occupation and free trade. In 1892, the British jumped on the Yorubas, killing and burning for their refusal to come under British protection and obstructing British intrusion into their lands. By 1896, all Yoruba land was conquered and ruled from Lagos by Britain. In 1898, the British merchant soldiers of the Royal Niger Company took Kaba, Bida, and later Iloran. They then marched to Sokoto and Gwandu they took Guandu in 1900, overthrew the Emir of Yola, Zubairu, in 1901, and in 1903, conquered Sokoto to end the empire of Uthman Danfodu. They conquered everywhere and imposed their colonial rule on Nigeria. So it happened all over Africa. The major reason why Africa was conquered, humiliated, and rampaged was the superior firepower of the Europeans, who came with cannon, rockets, magazine guns, mines, and machine guns to face Africans with bows, arrows, and spears. The situation has not changed today. Africa is still militarily weak, despite the huge amounts of money diverted into defense, which are mainly used to pay salaries and allowances instead of internal arms production. Effects of colonialism on Africa On the good side, Africans got Western education, linked up with the outside world, and faster rates of development. On the negative side, Africans lost millions of her sons and daughters in the process of conquering Africa. Many nations were carved out of Africa without respect for ethnic lines. Thus, Yorubas are found in Nigeria and Benin, and Somalis are in Ethiopia, Kenya, and Somalia. This situation has given rise 
to numerous border disputes and wars in Africa today. The balkanization of Africa has weakened Africa in all spheres of life. Africa's dressing, consumption, thinking, marriage patterns have become externally oriented. Thus, Africans prefer foreign-made goods to the ones made in their country. Not only these, African states generally have pulled into the Western capitalist mode of political and economic organization, which is part of our problems today. Colonialism also destroyed social solidarity in Africa and created alienated individualism without social responsibility. Colonialism cut off the newly emerging people of Africa from science and technology, and indigenous rulers since independence have not corrected this problem. Hence, Africa is scientifically and technologically backward today. Decolonization in Africa. Decolonization is the process or act of ending colonial rule and freeing the colony and securing self-rule or independence. It involves the removal of the agents of colonial power from the government and the new nation. What was Africa's reaction to colonization? Africans did not take kindly to foreign rule, but the military might of the European conquistadors was overwhelming. It was therefore impossible to overthrow the colonial government. Africans' reactions started with revolts and riots, like the Aba Women's Riot of 1929, strikes and demonstrations, and frequent demands for independence. In some countries like Algeria, the demand for independence was backed up with armed liberation struggle. Thus, Africans had to pursue their emancipation with diplomacy. This diplomacy of decolonization implied the adoption of different strategies to ensure independence. Three different strategies can be mentioned here. Each nation's nationalists adopted the strategy that best suited the situation in their country. One, peaceful process. This involved peaceful constitutional conferences and negotiations like in the case of Nigeria, Ghana, and so on. Two, violent process involving armed liberation struggles like in the case of Algeria, Angola, Mozambique, Guinea-Bissau, and so on. Three, violent come peaceful processes involving both armed struggle and constitutional conferences like in the cases of Kenya, Mau Mau Revolt, and Zimbabwe. Note, Africans did not take kindly to foreign rule, but the military might of the European conquistadors was overwhelming. It was therefore impossible to overthrow the colonial government. However, Africa's reactions started with revolts and riots, like the Aba Women's Riot of 1929, strikes and demonstrations, and frequent demands for independence. In some countries like Algeria, the demand for independence was backed up with armed liberation struggle. Factors that accelerated the decolonization process. Several factors did contribute. Some of these factors were internal to Africa, while others were external, that is, from outside Africa. The internal factors that increase the tempo of nationalism and decolonization include 1. The desire and demand for economic development. Many Africans who traveled to the lands of the colonial masters observed the marked differences between those lands and African lands and wanted independence for faster economic progress. Two. 
the desire to participate in African economies. Africans were not pleased with the domination of their home economies by European businessmen. E.g., in Nigeria, the United African Company, UAC, by 1949, controlled 34% of all imported commercial merchandise in Nigeria. Six European firms joined to form the Association of West African Merchants, AWAM, which controlled about 60% of Nigeria's imports and 70% of her exports. Europeans also controlled the shipping lines and banking services. The banks in giving credits discriminated against Africans. Europeans also dominated the mining industry. 3. Rising cost of living between 1929 and 1939, the interwar years, European nations faced economic depression and the prices of primary products brought from Africa fell heavily, creating hardships and rising costs of living. 4. The activities of the press. The press generated political consciousness among the people and kept the outside world informed on political events in Africa. In West Africa, for example, Dr. Azikiwe revolutionized journalism by directing it towards the cause of decolonization through his West African pilot. 5. The Educated Elite The educated Africans dominated the struggle for independence. In West Africa, there were people like Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, Dr. Azikiwe, Herbert Macaulay, Chief Obafemi Awolowo, Chief H.D. Davis, Kesley Hayford, and so on. The presence of such educated people gave the colonial administration assurance that there were Africans educated and responsible enough to govern the territories if given independence. 6. Activities of political parties Political parties wanted political power to be transferred to them. They wanted political power to make decisions that respected the wishes and needs of Africans, not those of Europeans. In Ghana, for example, Dr. J.B. Dankwa and George Grant formed the United Gold Coast Convention in 1947, and in Nigeria, Herbert Macaulay formed the Nigerian National Democratic Party in 1922. 7. There was social discrimination against Africans in their land by Europeans in public places, hotels, hospitals, post offices, and so on. Whites occupied top civil service posts. Social clubs were formed for whites only, e.g. a Greek hospital in Lagos was for whites only. 8. Missionary Education Africans educated on the four arts in the primary school, reading, writing, religion, and arithmetic, turned their education against the colonists. They helped in interpreting newspaper and other publications to the illiterate and also explained the issues at stake to them. Racial Role of Colonial Churches 1. The churches looked upon African culture with disdain and contempt and saw its elements as anti-God and anti-religious. The leadership of African nationalism took this also as basis of colonial resistance. Many of them boycotted the churches on Sundays, as they then believed that the God of the white man was different from the God of the black man, and met under three shades, reciting revolutionary and anti-colonial verses. Of course, the church was the arm of colonial system which was aimed at softening the people's mind 
and resistance to colonial rule. Thus, the people were told political lies in religious institutions, e.g. that resistance to colonial authority was resistance to the will of God, that the servant cannot be greater than the master, that the position of individuals in life is God-ordained. The idea of using religion to bring people into surrendering to external political forces was new only to southern parts of Nigeria then. Before European invasion and coming of Christianity, the Fulani Muslim elements had done the same to the Hausa and other inhabitants of the northern part. The external factors that fueled nationalism and decolonization include the following. 1. The taste of nature of colonization by colonizers. During the Second World War, Germany under Hitler set out to rule the world. His Nazi forces overran many European nations, including France, and the citizens of these countries got a taste of what colonization meant and resisted it. Colonized Africans made use of this experience to reject continuous colonization in their continent, insisting that since French, American, British, and other Europeans did not want Germans to rule them, Africans must equally rule themselves. 2. The military weakness of colonial states. Especially after the Second World War, Many colonial states became weakened militarily. E.g., France, out of weakness, had to leave Algeria. During the Second World War, Japan overran Malaysia, which was under British protection. Britain did nothing, so Africans said her imperial might was mere paperwork. 3. Wartime Developments African soldiers, that is, ex-servicemen, who took part in the Second World War against Germany in Burma, India, North Africa, saw the whites cry and die in the war fronts like blacks. Many whites ran away from the hot war fronts, and these destroyed the myth of European superiority. Also, the African soldiers saw and learned how Pandit Nehru and Mahatma Gandhi were leading successful nationalism against Britain in India, even during the war. The African soldiers on coming home after the war also saw the difference between the poor African societies colonized by the whites and the buoyant European societies. The war veterans therefore joined the African nationalists to fight for independence. Because many of the veterans got educated abroad, they spread ideas too. The roads, railways, airstrips, harbors, which were developed during the war, helped the nationalists to move far and wide in the societies, educating the people. 4. The Atlantic Charter of 1941 signed by the U.S. and Britain, embodied the wartime objectives of the Allied forces, fighting to defend democracy and freedom. The Charter emphasized the principle of self-determination for all people who fought the war, and Africans knew of this, and at the end of the war, demanded self-determination, liberty, and freedom. The Charter became the Nationalist Charter for Freedom for Article 3 of the Charter stated that the signatories to the Charter respected the rights of all peoples to choose their own form of government. 5. The Rise of USA and Her Pro-Independence Stance The U.S. basing on her colonial experience from Britain as at the time opposed the continuous colonization of any people. This anti-colonial stand of the U.S. encouraged Africans. President Roosevelt said 
He will support British decolonization of her colonial territories. 6. International organizations like the UNO, non-aligned movement, and so on, provided platforms for debate on the demands for independence. 7. The British Labour Party, then opposition party, also recognized the right of the colonies to choose their own form of government. It condemned colonialism as immoral. 8. Activities of West African Students' Union, WASU. West African students in the USA and Britain sent delegations to government officials to explain the colonial situation in Africa. They also organized public study sessions, symposia, and debates for the same purpose. These activities influenced U.S. and British public opinion. 9. Pan-Africanist agitation Pan-Africanism played the major role in uniting African population against colonialism. Here, people like Marcos Gave, W. Du Bois, among others, are remembered. Imprisonment of Africa after independence During colonial rule, our nationalists made a lot of promises to the masses of the people as things to be enjoyed or gained when the white man was driven away and independence achieved. They talked about life more abundant, full employment, removal of discrimination, national unity, and respect for human rights, and so on. But these have not been achieved since independence in most African states. There is mass poverty everywhere, hunger and starvation, unemployment, civil wars, border disputes, political repression, etc. All these arise from the fact that the colonial masters in several African states handed over power to their friends and not to those Africans that loved the people. They did so because they wanted African rulers who will continue to protect the white man's interest in Africa. They still want African markets for Western goods. They want African land for investments. They still want the cheap labor in Africa and so on. To protect and promote their interest in Africa, therefore, the former colonial masters and their friends have adopted several strategies to keep African states down. These strategies are political, economic, cultural, military, and psychological. Post-colonial strategies of Africa, there is mass poverty everywhere, hunger and starvation, unemployment, civil wars, border disputes, political repression, etc. All these arise from the fact that the colonial masters in several African states handed over power to their friends and not to those Africans that love the people. They did so because they wanted African rulers who will continue to protect the white man's interest in Africa. They still want African markets for Western goods. They want African land for investments. They still want the cheap labor in Africa and so on. To protect and promote their interest in Africa, therefore, the former colonial masters and their friends have adopted several strategies to keep African states down. These strategies are political, economic, cultural, military, and psychological. Post-colonial strategies of Africa's imprisonment. Political strategies. The political strategies employed by colonial masters include the following. A. Ensuring that the rulers of African states are those who will protect the interests of whites. Whenever patriotic Africans take over power, the Europeans will try to overthrow them. 
This is what was done to Maurice Allah Mohammed in Nigeria in 1976. Kwame Nkrumah of Ghana, the President Alende of Chin. In this type of operation, the armed forces of the African states are misused. B. Creation of new colonial international organizations such as the UNO by Europeans. C. Manipulations and destabilization of regional international organizations such as ECOWAS, OAU, non-aligned movement, so that they don't work in unity to achieve their goals. D. The use of international law to advance European interests, such as the law of compensation or expropriation, which demands adequate and prompt compensation for assets nationalized by any developing country. E. Engineering tension and wars between African states in order to sell European weapons and keep Africa unstable and unable to pursue serious development programs. F. Manipulation of political leaders in Africa and using and helping them to crush patriots who oppose continued foreign and comprado oppression and exploitation of the masses. G. Fanning embers of religious and ethnic differences in Africa to ensure disunity and thus retard the rate of development. Economic strategies. The economic strategies employed by colonial masters include the following. A. Ensuring the continued dependence of African states on Western thoughts and models of development through external loans, grants, food aid, military aid, machineries, and so-called experts. B. Ensuring mounting debt burden on African states. C. Signing contracts and agreements that do not favor Africans via 10% bribe to their local agents in government. D. Use of multinational corporations to influence the government and politics of African states and to continue the economic exploitation of labor and resources in Africa. E. Keeping down scientific and technological advancement. Cultural strategies. The following are cultural strategies employed by colonial masters. A. Continued use of foreign languages as lingua franca in African states. Thus, we think and write mainly in English, French, and Portuguese. B. Use of films novels, magazines, pornographic ones especially, music such as pop and disco jives, advertisement and so on, to inculcate western modes of life. See how wrestling was introduced in Nigeria through television. The western mode of wrestling in which people's legs and heads are broken with bones, metallic objects and so on have been promoted excessively, leaving African wrestling that depend on skill and promote our culture. C. Manipulation of local leaders. Manipulation of local leaders to keep our educational system unproductive and the hospitals mere consulting centers. In this way, ignorance and diseases continue to devastate Africa. Military strategies. The military strategies adopted by colonial masters include the following. A. Engineering of coups, as in Chile in 1970, to oust socialist president Allende. B. Military invasion of African states, whose leaders are seen as serious threats to European interests, e.g. Portuguese invasion of Guinea-Bissau in 1970 and America's bombardment of Libya in 1986. C. 
ensuring the continued dependence of African states on European nations for military weapons so that they can't defend themselves. D. The continuation of arms race, which spill over to Africa and cause the diversion of scarce economic resources into defense while starving health, education, agriculture, and so on. Psychological strategies. Psychological strategies adopted by the colonial masters to underdevelop Africa include A. Propaganda welfare against patriotic African leaders and Africa. B. Promotion of wrong systems of democracy, such as the lavish praises showered on the presidential election in Nigeria in 1983 by American leaders and media men, when we Nigerians knew that it was the worst election so far in Africa. C. Advertisement of European achievements while insisting that Africa has contributed nothing to human civilization. D. Attributing every bad and evil thing in the world to Africa. AIDS was said to have originated from Africa, whereas it came from the United States from available data. Strategies for liberating Africa. Africa's emancipation will result from a careful study of the strategies used by the European exploiters and their African quislings to keep Africa down and neutralizing those wicked strategies. In addition, the followings need to be given serious thought. 1. The enthronement of good, patriotic African leaders in power. With good leadership, proper planning, and good management of national economy and resources, and so on, will follow. 2. This will then make it possible for the masses to be enlightened and mobilized for patriotism, nationalism, self-reliance, national security, and abundant production of foods, goods and services, and technological development and output. 3. Maximization of economic, scientific, and technological development and output. Our scientists and intellectuals should be mobilized and assigned tasks and time targets to produce our own drugs, cars, televisions, trucks, train engines and coaches, airplanes, telephones, military equipment and so on. The Biafran experience an example in the production of some of these, even though in crude form during the Civil War, shows that Africans can think originally and produce their own goods. 4. For the production of adequate food, drugs, military weapons and many more, the military should be reorganized and given socio-economic development tasks. The people should be integrated with the armed forces and every African should have military training so that the defense of the fatherland should be the duty of all. 5. Military power must be maximized through A. Military training for all B. Indigenous production of weapon systems and development of nuclear power 6. All African states must take effective control of their economies, nationalizing where necessary, so foreign companies. Africa cannot be free without taking control of her economy. 7. Blacks in diaspora need to be mobilized, too, as an important constituent of the march for Africa's emancipation. 8. The OAU must concretize achievements of its objectives. Tip. Maximization of economic, scientific, and technological development and output. Our scientists and intellectuals 
should be mobilized and assigned tasks and time targets to produce our own drugs, cars, televisions, trucks, train engines and coaches, airplanes, telephones, military equipment and so on. Africa must be liberated from the suckers and stranglehold of imperialists, that is the Western and Eastern imperialists and their local fronts. It is time for Africa to rise and tell her own story. The black man has suffered enough for the comfort of other races of the world. Africa is potentially the richest continent in the world, yet her resources are not being enjoyed by the masses of Africa, but by foreign exploiters and their few local helpers. The future generations of Africa must see better life. We must take our destiny in our own hands now. Study Session Summary In this study session, you have learned about colonization, effects of colonization and decolonization. We also discussed how the colonial master has underdeveloped Africa with different strategies and the measure that could be made by Africans to liberate themselves. End of study session 8. Thanks for listening.